Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Paleocrat Diaries on the Meaning of Catholic. I'm your host for part two of Romano Gardini's Reflections on the Lord's Prayer. I'm Jake Fowler, and welcome once again. Happy fourth week of Advent. I hope it's been a fruitful time of penance and preparation for you and your family. Hopefully you're teaching your children some Advent hymns and and just really imbibing all of the traditions that our beautiful church offers to us this time of year in preparation for the Feast of Christmas, the celebration of the Word made flesh. It's amazing. It's remarkable. And I... Well, I can't wait. Let's be honest. I feel like a kid, but I cannot wait for Christmas. It's going to be amazing. I apologize that it has been no less than three weeks since I put out part one. I intended to do this two weeks ago, but my youngest son had other ideas. He knocked over the tripod that the camera sits on. It's right there. It fell to the floor, and it crashed, not into a million pieces, but into two pieces, and that was enough to break the lens. So, save up a little money, go to the camera shop, get a new lens, troubleshoot, get it all set up, and here we are. Three weeks later, better late than never, uh, I'm rolling on an extreme version of Kaiser Standard Time right now. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. All right, enough of that. Without further ado, allow me to switch my screen. Take a sip of some tea, and let us begin. So last time, uh, we looked at the gateway into the Lord's Prayer, and Monsignor Guardini identifies this gateway as uh, the phrase, Thy will be done. The will of God offers to us a certain disposition of mind and heart that's necessary and indeed uh, quite fruitful for understanding the rest of the prayer. So having seen in the previous reflection, again, the entry point, we're now prepared to proceed. We have this foundational disposition. Uh, it, it's, it's one that recognizes the immediacy and the urgency of the will of God the gravity of it, the immense tension that man feels being burdened and at the same time oddly liberated by fulfilling it, and on the other hand, the frailty, the fragility of God's will on earth. He needs us. We need him. It can easily be not done and thwarted and worked against, but he always ensures that it is somehow done in his providence. The solicitude with which we attempt to fulfill it by his grace, of course, is an entry. It's a mysterious entry into a relationship with the Almighty. And again, it shows us the attitude, the petition, thy will be done, shows us the necessary disposition that we must possess in order to begin to comprehend the remainder of the prayer. Now, I want to be clear about something because Monsignor Guardini is clear. He says, it's not as if we can deduce through a series of uh, propositions and logical reasoning the remainder of the prayer as if it will just solve itself like a puzzle. That's not what we mean when we say we have the gateway or the key, the entry point. What he means and what we should mean, hopefully, is that, again, it shows us the attitude that allows for contemplation, the approach necessary to unpacking the entirety of the Lord's Prayer is one that begins from a point of seeking to do the will of God, seeking to submit ourselves, to humble ourselves, to acknowledge when we've failed, And to try again, and relying on his grace amidst all of that for the accomplishment of his holy will. So with that, we can move in to the first line. 
Our Father, who art in heaven. In the very first two words of the prayer, which most of us just, I mean, let's be honest, we just gloss over them. We're praying rosaries and we're praying our other daily prayers, whether whatever they may be. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Too fast, too far. Our Father. There's a startling reality here already to confront. One that's, again, too often taken for granted. And the reality is this. We are seeking another. We're seeking that our hearts will connect with his and find rest. This is reminiscent of Augustine in book one of the Confessions. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, uh, you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. That's, that's probably pretty close, actually. But our hearts are restless. You have made us for yourself. And when I turn to you and pray, our Father, I'm seeking after you. Immediately, there's the dimension of communion, relationship, the other, whom I must give myself to, who in turn gives himself to me. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's flipped. God gives himself to us first, and we respond. Guardini in the book, which I don't have in front of me, unfortunately, he sets his focus initially in this, uh, what is the first chapter after the introduction, on, on the second portion of the phrase, who art in heaven. And we're not merely interested, he says, in the words, but the reality behind them. In this way, these are, these are my thoughts now, words are sacramental. They're sensible things. You can hear them. You can write them and you can see them. Through the material, the sensible, right, the, the bodily, if you will, the immaterial is disclosed and made present. We're not just dealing with words on a page. We're dealing with a person. And insofar as we remember this, our words are sacramental. They are incarnational. They, if we allow them to, they can remind us that we are, are approaching the divine other who became one of us for our own sake. First up, who? Our Father, who? Again, we're immersed in this sensible world, and it's often very easy for us to miss the forest for the trees. Religious man, homo religiosus. It's easy to sense the creator in creation. It's almost overwhelming, as a matter of fact. Once you latch on to that, once you have a sense of that, in all of the various things around us, you can't not see it. Now, we don't, we're not always consciously thinking that, of course. But it doesn't take long, once you've sensed it at first, to remind yourself that these creatures imply a creator. And all these things, real as they may be here and now, they're contingent. They're not the necessary one that we seek. And again, once we are recollected, just takes a moment. It's not too difficult to detect the presence of that one whom we seek, one who transcends the material world. This presence is, at one and the same time, mysterious and familiar. And all creation, again, if we allow it to, acts as a signpost pointing us toward this one reality, if we're willing to pay attention, 
orienting us toward God. Right? This is, uh, I think I typed in here somewhere, this is reminiscent of Romans chapter 1, where St. Paul makes it clear that God can be known from his creation. Simple as that. Every noble dimension of life bears this out. Think about God's providence, our destiny, the unfolding of history, existence itself. We could go on. Something about all of these things is transcendent, all-pervading, all-embracing. What is it? What is it about these things that ties them all together in such a way, marching forward through history, sensing the hand of God in the events of our lives and of the world in general? This togetherness that we feel with one another, this togetherness with this mysterious presence, what is it? It's the divine. It could only be. And these words reveal something deeper, something deeper than that. This divinity, says Monsignor Guardini, isn't some impersonal force. It's not simply some uh, vague notion that holds all else together and gives a context for meaning. That would be great, right? That, that would, in fact, be a blessing. But that's not what we have. This divine something is actually a someone. And it's not just a someone. It's someone we are called to look upon. Someone with a heart to which we can turn. This someone is a person in the fullest sense. So when we pray, our Father, who? We don't say what or that. We say who. Capital W. This is a divine person. This realization, we shouldn't take it for granted. I say that a lot, but I really do mean it. This is a, a prayer we teach to our children, and it's a prayer we pray at, at least probably once a day. I have to imagine everybody prays this at least once a day. And so it, it, it comes almost too easily to our intellect. It either gives us a wrong impression or a mistaken sense of security. Of course, God's our Father. How could we, why, why would we think otherwise? This is silly. This is ridiculous. Why would anybody think otherwise? But is it really that easy? And let's be honest. No, it's not. If we, in fact, are being honest, for the majority of us, and I would include myself here in this majority, it's no small task to locate within ourselves, in prayer, an inner vision that finds him. Just because I can think it and I can understand the concept doesn't really translate always to living it. It doesn't translate to an understanding of the heart. And that's what we're after. Remember, Christ did not come to save the rich or the intelligent or the powerful only. He came for every man. And so the prayer that our Lord himself gave us, it's not a, an intellectual puzzle to be solved. It's a matter of the heart. Those who do, you know, whatever proportion of minority, whatever, uh, however small they may be, those who have great facility in prayer, they should be grateful because it is indeed a grace. And they should know, be, be, be known right now, know that it isn't common. Prayer is a struggle for most. The rest of us, 
we know firsthand how grueling the experience can be to gain a foothold and to reach the undefined and incomprehensible. So if you do uh, find that to be easy, count your blessings. Because most do not. And so, yes, we can say, God is our Father, of course he is. But do we really understand that with our heart? And even considering all these things apart from our experiences, whatever they may be, the fact that God him, himself is a person, that's a great gift. Think of it this way. The way God is, is a gift from God. God has first called us. I mentioned this a little while ago. He is the one who takes the initiative. He addresses us. He, as a person, addresses us as a person. And he gives us, uh, Guardini's phrase here is, giving us faces of our own. The face, something unique to human beings. We say animals have faces, but analogously so. A person has a face, a countenance. And he bestows upon us that great blessing. Not for no reason. It's the nature of persons, it's part of the nature of persons, to have communion. And we are made, as Augustine reminds us, specifically for communion with God. We are persons because he is a person and he desires relationship with us. And only persons can have a real relationship. And to that end, we are to address him directly as a person. Now, this ability to communicate doesn't come with any particular limitations. Thank goodness. It doesn't matter where we are. There's no certain place or time. There's no order in which you must do things. There's no special task or ritual that must be performed. All you do is address him and the words will find their home. You say, Our Father, who art in heaven. You could be laying in bed. You could be at work. You could be driving in your car. You could be stranded on the top of a mountain, drowning in the ocean, anywhere in between. It doesn't matter. He's a person. We're a person. We can address him. Our Father who art in heaven. Next up, art in heaven. Having looked at the, t the who, we move on. God is in everything as the one who is in heaven. And he is everywhere as the one who is in heaven. He's not, mm, not everything is infused with little God molecules. We're not talking about some kind of pantheism here. And we don't mean the physical ubiquity of God either. But he is here and there, wherever you are. He's among us, and yet he's transcended. Heaven is the way God is with himself. It's the impenetrable mystery of Trinitarian communion, hidden from us for now, but most real, absolutely real, more real than we are real. There are hints of heaven inside each of us. We can almost sense, right, and, and sense, again, analogously, almost sense what it must be like. It must be pure, holy, calm, bright, 
It's probably strange and familiar, beautiful. All of these things. This is why St. Paul says, I has not seen, ear has not heard. Because how can we make sense of all that at, at once? What must that thing be to have such peace and joy and comfort and all the things I just said? How do all these go together? We don't know. We have to be very careful, Guardini cautions, not to distort it not to let it devolve into some sort of sentimentality. What we desire is nothing less than communion with God. And heaven is precisely that. It's our homeland, even though it is the very otherness of God. It's that mysterious and yet familiar place that's not really a place we're, we're we, we desire it we're pining for it we're nostalgic for it but we've never been and we don't know how to describe it but here we are and starting from the here and now of our existence we can call out to him who is utterly transcendent. When we do so, when we, when we say the words, who art in heaven, we're admitting, uh, implicitly anyways, that he is different from all else. From all that we're engaged in, all that we're familiar with, from all that we've ever seen, heard, done, God is different. He is that other to seek him, again, is a recognition of this and an acceptance of it. We're perfectly okay with it. We know, at least we should know, we know what we're doing, why we're doing it. We know whom we seek. It's not an acceptance that's a, uh, a prescription. It's, it's not as if we are assigning to God his proper role amidst the multitude of, of things that go into our lives, right? All of the many factors and aspects of our earthly existence, and we carve out a little chunk and we say, okay, I need like a divine something to go here. Ah, yes, perfect. It's not what we mean. We want him just the way he is. We desire the full mystery, even though... We almost never can articulate that. Almost never. Again, because in, in this mysterious otherness, he is our home. So we want it. We know we want it. We know it's other. We're okay with that. We like it for that. <laughs> Who wants to be here forever? We want to be with him. And again, Augustine comes to mind. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. So, Guardini says, we dare to address ourselves to God. He is in heaven. We are here on earth. And we're bold enough to speak to the Lord. This reminds me of uh, one of my favorite verses in the scriptures where Abraham is speaking to God and he acknowledges that it's not exactly presumption, but it seems like Abraham is being very bold. This is in Genesis 18. I who am but dust and ashes, I dare to speak to my Lord. Something like that. We don't want a God who's circumscribed by earthly concepts. We don't want a God to be like a human being. We desire nothing other than the living God himself. We want the I am. We want 
the God who reveals himself in the burning bush. Have we gone too far? What about the incarnation? I said a moment ago, we don't want a God like a human being. Doesn't Monsignor Guardini know about the incarnation? It may seem at first, if you read that, that he's made an error, but I don't think so. He doesn't mean that we don't want the Word made flesh. He means we don't want a God fashioned after our conception of God. We don't want a God like what we would have imagined. We want him like he is. And why don't we want a God that we would imagine? Well, because it's probably a distortion. In fact, almost certainly so. It would be us desiring to have a God made after our image and likeness, rather than to receive his being as it truly is. And that's one way um, to desire a God who's more tolerable, who's easier to handle, more comfortable. This is one way our human nature tries to guard against the reality of the divine. By making him just like us. By making God just uh, the best form of a human being possible. He's just a really great guy. This is a defense mechanism. We make him innocuous, right? He's our buddy. He's our pal. He's our, he's our example because, you know, nobody's perfect after all. We, we comfort ourselves. But when we make him innocuous, when we make God after our own image and likeness, after our own distorted conceptions, then he's easy to ignore. And if you don't believe me, ask your neighbors when the last time they prayed in Our Father was. It's a subtle and it's a hidden defense for sure, but it's a real one. And it's threatening a lot of people. Does it threaten us? Maybe. Sometimes. Well, the result is, naturally, that we wouldn't be conversing with God through prayer. We would just be sort of affirming ourselves, right? It would be sort of like, uh, I think it was, well, I don't know who thought of it, honestly, but the uh, moralistic therapeutic deism, MTD. I've heard Father Dwight Longenecker talk about this. I don't know if he came up with the concept or not, but... Basically, we just want, you know, this fuzzy being to kind of live in the sky and make sure that everybody goes to heaven. And, you know, as long as I really haven't killed anybody, I'm good. And I'm going to pray that I get a good job and like my kids are smart and stuff like that. And everything's just going to be great. That's not talking to God. That's just saying what we want. Just trying to reaffirm our own desires. It has nothing to do with God's will for our lives. Trying to make God more like a human being. This was largely, this is sort of unrelated, but kind of related. This was largely the project of... Um, the, uh, the the quest for the historical Jesus, right? I forget who the name of the guy who started that. Um, but what it boils down to is that when we, when we go on this uh, supposed quest for the historical Jesus by peeling back all of the layers of myth in the Bible, all of the supernatural, we just want to get down to who was really was Jesus. Well, it turns out we just end up fashioning him like we want him to be. And that is something we must avoid like the plague. We want God the way he is. And that's what the words in heaven are meant to signify. That's the way we're supposed to take them. When we say our father who art in heaven, we're saying not the way we want, but how you, Lord, really are. We want God how he is in himself, not how we'd like him to be. But this comes with a risk, a big risk. 
a huge risk, as a matter of fact, monumental. You can't even describe it. And here's the risk. By opening ourselves to this God in heaven, the totally other, we are allowing ourselves to be disturbed by the entry of God into our lives. It's not an interference, but it may be an intervention. And when we take this step, when we desire to fulfill God's will and to seek him as he is, there are obligations. There are requirements. There are expectations laid upon us. It becomes incumbent upon us to open ourselves to the action of the Holy Spirit. And when we say that we want God as he is, we're saying that we're willing to take upon ourselves his yoke. We are willing to conform ourselves to his will, to live as Christ lived. Indeed, uh, St. Paul, Galatians 2, not simply to live as Christ lived, but that Christ might live in me, in you, and everyone else for that matter. To allow that, to respond to his grace in such a way that we recognize God's personhood, his otherness, that we want him as he is, that this is our mysterious and yet familiar heavenly homeland. We want God in us living a life of grace. We want that. That is the sum of chapter one. So now this is part two. Well, this was part two. It's, it's pretty much over. We've looked at the gateway to the prayer in part one. If you didn't catch that one, look back. It's there. I promise. Next week, ideally, uh, in the octave of Christmas, we'll tackle part three, which will be chapter two in the book, The Lord's Prayer, by Monsignor Romano Guardini. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. I hope your kids get um, everything their little hearts desire. I hope your Mass that you go to is beautiful. I hope there are Christmas carols. I hope there's incense. I hope you see lots of holly and evergreens and candles and see good friends and family. And just remember that the Word was made flesh, and He dwelt among us. It's amazing. And that's what, that's what this is all about. That's why we do this. That's why I always tell you to never give up, to keep on smiling, and to memento mori.